Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I am from California, so apologies. I will say this, uh, we are deep on the bench, as was said. I don't think I'm even on the bench. Um, if our time this morning was a work of man, then I'd say let's all just head to lunch and call it a day. But we're here because our time is a work of God, and he can work through me. I know despite my weaknesses and where I'm at, and so my prayer this morning is that God will work through me. He'll speak to us through his word, and that we can all be encouraged and grow in him today. Um, as said, our text this morning is Ecclesiastes 8. I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear an entire chapter of Ecclesiastes on a Sunday morning, but I hope that you will leave this morning encouraged. And the title of my sermon is The Limits of Wisdom. Um, let me ask this. How many sermons have you heard on the topic of wisdom? Whether as the main topic or perhaps just spoken of uh, during the application of a text. Um, if you've heard much from Proverbs, I imagine you've heard some of this. You can't get very far in Proverbs without the topic of wisdom coming up. Uh, and of all those sermons that you've heard on wisdom, how many steered you away from acting in wisdom? How many concluded that following the course of wisdom may actually lead you astray? My guess is none. And, uh, well, friends, I'm here to preach the first then. Now, before you get concerned, before you start texting Mark and Kevin and wonder when they're going to be back and where they found this guy, let me assure you, I'm not here to contradict anything you've heard. I'm not here to tell you wisdom shouldn't be pursued. It absolutely should. But I'm here to speak of the limits of wisdom, that it can only get us so far. And I, I think that's what we'll see in Ecclesiastes. Now, I'm going to give you a brief background for those of you who aren't familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes. It's somewhere in the Old Testament. Um, it is written by King Solomon. Throughout, he refers to himself as the preacher. That's kind of the self-acclaimed title. Each translation uses a slightly different word. Um, preacher, the teacher, they say. And he says in chapter 1, verse 1, what his goal is in writing this book of Ecclesiastes. And let me read that for you in, um, not verse 1, verse, I think it's 13. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So that's his goal. I don't know if you picked up on it. I certainly didn't at first. But his goal is not to seek wisdom. Finding wisdom isn't what he's doing. But to seek by wisdom. So using wisdom, what can be understood about what goes on under the sun? So it's not the goal of his search, it's the means or the method of his search. So before I go a few, any further, let me just talk a little bit about wisdom generically. First, wisdom is primarily a means by which we make future decisions, right? If we talk about what is wise, being wise, it's about, we think about it in context of how I'm going to move forward, not so much what I've, where I've been in the past. It, it feeds our decision making going forward. Second, being wise, acting in wisdom, can rarely, if ever, guarantee a certain outcome. Wisdom is the best direction we can head, but it doesn't always guarantee an outcome. And that's why uh, the book of Proverbs is called the book of Proverbs and not the book of promises. It speaks much of wisdom, and it tells us how to act wisely, but it doesn't end in guarantees. The third thing on wisdom is that I was struck that we, as Christians, often think about godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. I think we have these categories in our mind, but I've asked you to, if I asked you to define the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, what would you say? What is the difference between the two? And my conclusion, after pondering this for some time, is the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom is faith. Worldly wisdom is about taking our knowledge, our experience, our understanding, our thoughtfulness, and producing a decision or guidance toward the future. And then godly wisdom is all that plus faith in w and faith in God and where that wisdom will take us. So which kind of wisdom is the preacher talking about here in Ecclesiastes? Is he talking about worldly wisdom or godly wisdom? And I think he's speaking of worldly wisdom. But the problem is, as 21st century Christians, we're always thinking of godly wisdom, so we read that into the text. And I think this is the reason why many of us don't really get Ecclesiastes. See, the preacher is trying to make sense of the world using wisdom without faith. And I think he is intentionally leaving faith off the table, which again is why we find many of his conclusions so perplexing. If you've read Ecclesiastes, 
I know I certainly have, you kind of get the end and you're like, that's it, that's the best you got. It feels kind of short of the goal. Now, let me try to put some, some thought to this. Over spring break, I had the, the joy of going to Boston uh, with Nam on a missions trip uh, through the seminary, and we got to visit a number of church plants and see what they were doing in Boston, and it's very exciting. Um, and I learned that to get around Boston, you kind of have three transport options. Well, you have walking, so that's always there, but if you don't want to walk, you get you got light rail, you have the subway system, and you have buses. Now, I grew up in a small town in California, so subways are quite a bit of fun, and those were definitely my favorite part. But the subway is only in the center of downtown. It's in the heart of downtown. If you want to get anywhere in the suburbs, the subway only gets you part of the way. You can get on the subway, but eventually you have to transfer to a bus to reach your final destination. So in that analogy, what if we were to think of the subway system as wisdom and the buses as faith? Meaning, the subway system can get you a lot of places, it's a lot of fun to ride, but it doesn't always get you to the final destination. Sometimes you need to hop on the faith bus to get the rest of the way. So I think the book of Ecclesiastes is mapping out the wisdom trains for us, but he leaves the existence of the faith bus unspoken. So he's describing the wisdom train, all the stops, all the places you, you can get with wisdom, but the idea of the faith bus is left unsaid. He's trying to figure out how far you can get with wisdom alone, but for us, we know that's not the end of the journey. To go further, we have to take the faith bus. Now, I'm going to keep referencing that analogy. I hope that's helpful. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the text. And let me pray for us as we open God's word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. I'm grateful for your word, Lord, that it is truth with a capital T. Truth that we can rely on, that we can build our lives upon, that we can follow unwaveringly. I pray that you will reveal that truth to us this morning. Speak through me despite my weaknesses and my sin. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified this morning. And we ask this in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, to understand chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, as, uh, as said, I'm going to kind of read it in parts. And to really understand it, I think we have to look at the beginning and the end. Because I think what we're going to see is that brackets the entire chapter to give us understanding of what we find in the middle. So let's open up with uh, 8 verse 1. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. Now the preacher here is extolling the virtues of wisdom. He's rhetorically asking, who is like the wise man? Meaning, who is better than the wise man? Who is more capable of interpreting a thing than a wise man? And the implied answer, nobody. Nobody's better. Nobody's as capable of a wise man. He said, a man's wisdom makes his face shine. Let me ask, what does that phrase remind you of? Where else in the Bible does it talk about shiny faces? Is there anything that pops to mind? Well, I can think of a couple. Maybe you're thinking of Exodus, where Moses uh, spent a lot of time with God on Mount Sinai. When he came down, his face was literally shining after spending so much time in God's presence. Or maybe you're thinking of Jesus at the Transfiguration. Matthew said in speaking of this, of Jesus, he said, His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Or maybe you're reminded of many of the Psalms which speak about God's fat face shining down upon us. And I, I think all of these, the idea of a shining face is proximity to God. So when the preacher says that wisdom makes a man's face shine, he is saying, that nobody is as close to God, as close to the divine, as a wise man. So, wisdom, very good. Chapter 1, this is great. All right, let's go to the end. Let's see where the chapter ends. Let's read verses 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom, and to see the business that is done on earth, had neither day nor night do one's eyes sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out, the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Now these verses are a little less optimistic about wisdom, wouldn't you say? We just read how wisdom brings us closer to the divine, and now we see that man cannot find out the work that is done under, under the sun. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. This is downright pessimistic about wisdom. Wisdom has failed the preacher on his quest. He, he set out to make sense of the world with wisdom as his guide, 
and now he's concluded it's not possible. The wisdom train cannot get him to his destination. The conclusion here is not that the preacher didn't have enough wisdom to find the answer, that he needs more wisdom. He is concluding, he's not concluding that wisdom is bad or that wisdom is not worth pursuing. What he is concluding here is that wisdom is not enough to understand everything that goes on under the sun. Wisdom has its limits. So what happened? How do we move from the optimism of verse 1, the, wi- the, the wise man's face is shining, down to this reality check we see at the end of the chapter? Well, that's what I want to spend the rest of our time looking at, and I think we'll see in the middle two things. We're going to see two sections. In verses 2 through 9, we'll see the failure of wisdom to understand and make sense of relationships between people, so horizontal relationships between you and me, between each other, between family. And then the second section, we'll look at verses 10 to 14, and we'll see the failure of wisdom to make sense of our relationship between people and God, so our vertical relationships. So how does wisdom fail horizontally and vertically? So let's start with that first section, uh, verses 2 through 9. So let me read that. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in the evil cause. For he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, What are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Now much can be said on these verses alone, but again, I want to focus on how they fit into the larger context of the chapter. I think these verses are saying something about the failure of wisdom to make sense of what goes on under the sun. I think the preacher is using a subject and his king as a case study to see if wisdom and if wisdom alone is sufficient to determine the right course of action. Can wisdom always counsel a person in the right way they they interact with their king? Now, we don't have kings, and that's okay. This is a case study we're trying to understand. And I think that the implicit answer to this question, and that's the implicit question that's being asked. The preacher wants to know if an infinitely wise person, King Solomon, for example, could essentially go through life without making any mistakes. Is such a thing even possible? If that is a hypothesis, how could we possibly prove it or disprove it? And I think the answer is you can't prove it, but you can disprove it. Because we all live in a unique set of circumstances, and we have different situations. So you could say, well, what about this? What about that? But if we can disprove it once, then therefore we can disprove it in all cases. So if it fails in the easiest case, then we can disprove this idea. Now, I know I'm a little abstract, so let me try to nail it down with an example. A few months ago was the NFL draft. I don't know if we have any football fans in here, Um, but it's a, a thing where teams get together and they pick new players for the coming season. They have to pick from all the rookies. There's dozens, hundreds of players who are ready to be picked for a team. And they spent a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of time deciding which players to pick and in which order, what positions do they need to fill. Each team has very specific requirements about what they're looking for. Now imagine a very smart person put together a computer program that they claimed could make the perfect prediction for every team every time. And they said, hey, if you, s- if you give me a million dollars, I'll sell you this computer program, and it's going to pick the perfect player every time for you. And they'd say, well, how could you possibly prove that? How will we know you picked the right player? You'll pick someone, but who's to say it picked the right player? Well, you'd set up a test case. You would say, well, let's find a way to prove it. So maybe you'd find a simple situation and, and, and test it out, for example. Now, let me ask this. Have you guys ever seen those Capital One commercials? These are on a lot um, where they're trying to prove how easy it is to use their card. There's this one where it cuts to a playground scene, and there's three kids like being picked for a basketball team, there's these two kids picking, and they're kind of peering out, and you see these three scrawny kids, and you see Charles Barkley. I don't know if you know, but Charles Barkley, ex-NBA player, he knows what he's doing. So this kid's like, hmm, which one do I pick? And he's like, hmm, I'll go with Barkley. 
You know, and Barclay's like, yeah, I still got it. it. As if it's a hard, you know, the joke is it's not actually a hard question. Well, what if this computer algorithm I took went there and picked one of the scrawny kids over Charles Barkley? Well, I'll tell you what, no NFL team would buy my computer program. I would be sunk, I'd be back in seminary, and I would not get my million dollars. Well, I think, again, that's what's happening here. There's a case study to say, the preacher saying, if I can show the failure of wisdom in the easiest case between a subject and his king, then I will prove its failure in all other cases. That should be the easiest choice. Now, so let's just kind of walk through this section. So he starts with, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. So we see God is on the king's side. This is good. In this period, a king was seen as an extension of God's rule. In many case, cases, kings were seen as God's representatives on the earth. You don't question the king, you obey the king. So what could be an easier choice to make? Why do we even need wisdom? You just obey the king, end of story. So that's the starting point. But then we start to see things unravel a bit. Next, next sentence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. Now, does that give you a lot of comfort? Don't take a stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. I mean, it's good advice, don't rebel against the king, but the reason isn't very good, because the king does whatever he wants. Uh, nothing about the, the king's righteousness, the king's goodness. So then we go on to the next verse. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may to say to him, what are you doing? Whoa, okay. So we have a king who does whatever he wants, and now we have nobody can question the king. That actually kind of sounds like a recipe for disaster, if you ask me. It sounds more like a reason to rebel than a reason to obey. How many scandals have erupted in recent years that could be traced to leaders without accountability? It really begs the question, is, is blind obedience to such a leader always the right course of action? Is it always the wisest course of action? So let's keep going. Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. Okay, we're back on track. Another very optimistic statement about wisdom. Uh, just like the first, that we should always obey the king. Obedience is saying will always result in good. With wisdom, one can always know the proper time and procedure or the proper course to take. But as we keep going, there's four more clauses in verses 6 to 7, and we see kind of reality seeping back in. There is a time and a way for everything. There is a wise path, but every king feels regret and heaviness. Why do the kings feel regret and heaviness? Because no king knows what is coming next. Why doesn't he know that? Because who could possibly tell him? Nobody can predict the future. The, what these are telling us, it's almost circular in logic, it, logic, bringing us down from this optimism of blind obedience to the king uh, that we saw early in verse 5. They're highlighting the ignorance of men. They're highlighting the ignorance of the king. And then in verse 8, we see how powerless the king really is. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of his death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. So in addition to the king being ignorant, his power is limited as well. So even if the king did somehow always desire to do the right thing, he doesn't actually have the power to do so. So now we get to the last verse, verse 9. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. What strikes me about this statement is that it wraps up all these observations between a subject and, and their king, and then applies it generically. What kind of relationship does the statement, when man had power over man to his hurt, what kind of situations does that apply to? Does it apply to a king and his subject? Yeah, that's the context here. What about a politician and his constituents? I'd say, yeah, it applies there. What about between a husband and a wife? Yeah, I think it applies there. A parent and a child? Yep, applies there. What about an employer and an employee? Yep, I think it applies there. What about a teacher and a student? Yep. In all these cases, I think it's safe to say there are a variety of relationships we're each in where there is a power differential. Some cases, we're on the side of power. In other cases, other relationships, we're on the side of submission. So what the preacher is telling us here is that the same way that kings are flawed and blind and that blind obedience is not always the wisest course of action, so too in our relationships. There are no guarantees. 
that acting in wisdom, that ma making the wisest choice in the moment, does not always lead to the best outcome. That the wisdom train stops short of where we often want and need to go. That even the wisest person will end up making some poor choices that don't turn out the way they would have liked. So is a preacher telling us to give up the pursuit of wisdom? To pursue folly instead? No, don't worry, that's not what he's saying. Notice there's no statement about this being vanity. We find that a lot in Ecclesiastes, but he doesn't say that here. He's not telling us to give it up. He's just pointing out the limits of wisdom, where the wisdom train ends. That what conclusions, so what conclusions might we draw from this? Well, first, I think we can find comfort in this text, in these observations. Comfort that you can never be wise enough to make perfect decisions. At some point in your decision-making process, whether in the past or yet to come, you're going to make decisions that don't turn out the way you would have liked. And we need to exercise faith in that. Now, my six-year-old son, Boaz, is sitting over here. Uh, a few months ago, we were getting ready for summer, and so we enrolled him in swim lessons because he's the type of kid, was the type of kid, who, you know, you're sitting in the pool, say, jump in. He's like, closer, closer, closer. And your arms are like, your hands are literally under his armpits, and you're like, this isn't jumping. This is like leaning forward. He's like, closer? You know, then he half fall, and you catch him, and it's like, all right, I did it, right? So he spent six weeks or so in lessons, and now he's doing great. He's cannonballing like you wouldn't believe. But in this class, he was a super timid kid, and there was this girl in there. I don't know, she was probably three, but she would jump in without a care in the world. The teacher was looking the other way, and she's just jumping in, and at least once, she was like floundering at the bottom, and the teacher's like, oh my goodness, and grabbed her, picked her up. She, you know, coughs out water, chokes, and is ready to go again. Absolutely no fear in the world. Now, I imagine some of you are like Boaz when it comes to making decisions. You tend to paralysis by analysis. You only want to make decisions that are guaranteed to be the wisest, that are guaranteed to lead to the place you want to go. And you're only willing to go places where the wisdom train makes a direct stop. You're like, I'll get off the train, but that's it. I'm not going an inch further. Others of you are like this little girl. You kind of avoid the subway, the wisdom trains. You don't like it one bit. You like to take the faith bus everywhere. Sometimes foolishly so, but other times well so. And what this passage is advocating is the middle ground, I think. Wisdom is necessary. It gets you around a lot of places. But we must pursue it, we must seek to grow in wisdom, but it has its limits. So I'd say to you, for the decisions that are coming up, be willing to take the step of faith. Seek wise counsel, don't act foolishly, and allow for the possibility of a negative outcome. It is possible. For the decisions you have already made, and perhaps now regret, I'd say give yourself some grace. It is impossible to make the best decision every time. It is not possible to reach the end of your life and look back without regrets. Just because a decision we made turned out poorly or not according to plan does not mean that it was foolish. We cannot retroactively label our decisions as wise or foolish based solely upon the outcome. Now, do you guys have a category for that? Does that make sense? I think we look back and that's what we think. If it went well, it was wise. If it went poorly, it was foolish. But truly, we can make the wisest decision in the moment, and it doesn't turn out the way we desire. But it's all part of God's purposes and part of God's plans. So wise decisions that we make are those that are made well, to the best of your ability at the time, and not just those that turn out well. We need to exercise faith. So let's move on to the next section. Let's talk about the relationship between man and God. This is verses 10 through 14. Now, where the last section was a case study in how well wisdom worked in making sense of relationships on this level between people, we're now going to see between God and man. So let's read 10 through 14 together. <clears throat> then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. 
There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Now, as we did with the last section, let's see what these verses are telling us about the larger context of the chapter between God and man. Now, these observations are a little more straightforward. I think you probably picked it up a little bit easier. And it's something we've all observed. Bad people seem to get away with things, right? We've seen that. We all know people who regularly and consistently break God's law, break his commands, and yet they seem to live prosperous lives. What are we to make sense of that? Well, specifically, the preacher here is talking about these wicked people going in and out of the holy place, the temple, while being praised in the city. So his frustration is not that these wicked people are gaming the political system or that they're just being mean to people and getting away with it. He's specifically looking between people and God, how they are breaking God's law with impunity. And his complaint is that they're going in and out of the temple without consequence. The problem seems to be that God is not exercising judgment on these people quickly enough. And that's his complaint. Now, I remember when I was reading through the Old Testament as a kid about the story of Uzzah. It, it, it befuddled me. I never really got it. I don't know if you guys know this story. He was this, this is the guy when David was moving the ark from where it was to Jerusalem. They stuck it on a cart. They started going. Thing was great. Uzzah was walking by the cart. It started to tip. He reached out to steady the ark, keep it from falling, keep God's ark from falling on the ground. Seems like a good thing. His reward? Lightning. He died. I mean, not lightning. I don't know how God worked, but he died. And you read the story, and you're like, what did he do wrong? Is it really that bad? Well, turns out you're not actually supposed to carry the ark on a cart. You're supposed to carry it so that you don't have this problem. So God's law had already been broken, and they were transporting the ark in a way that they weren't supposed to, probably for that very reason. So when you hear that story, it's easy to think the problem is with God, but the problem is not that God is sometimes cruel or unkind. The disconnect comes from the fact that he is so long-suffering. So often we break God's commands without immediate punishment, without suffering the immediate consequences of our sin. And so rather than being surprised when justice is administered immediately, like in the case of Uzzah, we should be surprised when it is delayed, as so often happens. Now, another reason I think that this section is about more than just fearing God is that the preacher contradicts himself between verses 12 12 and 13. First, he says that the wicked will prolong his days. Then he says that they won't. I don't know if you picked up on that. I think this is a rare example in Ecclesiastes of the preacher's faith coming out. The regular pattern of his writing is to make observations of what happens under the sun. However, in verse 12, he says, I know that it will be well with those who fear God. The statement didn't come out of any observation, which is very out of character. The truth is not the result of applying wisdom to all that has been observed. Wisdom alone would conclude that those who fear God sometimes get the short end end of the stick. So maybe it would be best to act in opposition to God. But the preacher simply cannot let that conclusion sit in the light of day. So he interrupts his thought experiment to make it clear and to talk about the faith bust a little bit, that faith is necessary. So the last thing I want to point out from this section is this final verse. He says, There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. Do you notice how generic that statement is? How it summarizes the entire section and applies it to everybody? Just like we saw in the last verse, at the end of the last section. So where the preacher makes a case study out of a wicked man who went into the temple with impunity, this verse now applies a lesson to everyone. All that to say, no amount of earthly wisdom can predict or explain the workings of God. The wisdom train may get us close, but it does not take us all the way. Now, I don't imagine this is news to any of you. I don't think any of us sitting here are surprised by this. We are often painfully aware that God does not act in predictable ways, in ways that we can fully understand or see. So what what application can we draw from this? Well, despite an intellectual awareness of this reality, I think that we often behave in opposition to it. 
What do I mean by that? Well, I think as Christians, we frequently try to divine God's will from our circumstances. When making decisions, we often determine the right course of action based upon wisdom plus circumstances. Not faith, circumstances. You got a call out of the blue about a job? God must want you to move. Pack the bags, we're going. The last three times you came out of a store, you saw a red Tesla sitting just so? God must want you to buy a Tesla. It's time to go get it. You found $20 on the sidewalk? God must want you to have it. You see, when the circumstances of life point to something good, we are very quick to say it came from God. And we hardly think about the, about the theology behind it. God must want this for us, we say. However, when we get in trouble, when things are difficult, when circumstances are not according to plan, now it's, it, it doesn't work that way. And it's especially problematic when we have trained ourselves to discern and di divine God's will from circumstances. What about the person who is sick and has found no relief after visiting a dozen doctors? What are they to conclude? Is God telling them to stop seeking relief and just suffer well? Is that the only conclusion we can draw? What about a, a recent college or high school graduate who's been filling out job applications for weeks, months even, and hasn't gotten a call back? Is God telling them to do something else? Is God telling them that they aren't to get a job? Is he telling them they chose the wrong career path? They should go back to McDonald's? What about the couple who's trying to get pregnant or maybe complete an adoption? And they've tried for weeks, months, years even, and nothing has come through. Is there a point after which they must conclude that God must not want them to have children? Is that the only conclusion that can be drawn from those circumstances? No, no it's not. There is no set of circumstances, good circumstances or bad circumstances, which are capable of conclusively conveying God's will to us. We simply cannot discern God's will through circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean we ignore our circumstances. We don't pretend like they mean nothing, but they are not vessels of God's truth to us. Do you want to know what God wants to, you to do with your life? What God's will for you is? We have a guidebook, friends, and it's called the Bible. This is where we find truth. This is where we discern God's will for our life. This is how God reveals himself to us through the words of Scripture. When we are making decisions, we need to act in wisdom, but also in faith. Did you recently have an exciting opportunity or desire? Great. Maybe God is leading you towards that. Maybe he's testing you. So what do you do? You pray about it? You seek the wisdom and counsel of others? You ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in this? Maybe you take the opportunity, maybe you don't, but you do so in faith. Do you feel like you're trying to go in a direction where every door and window is being shut in your face? Maybe God is telling you no. Maybe God doesn't want you to go there. Or maybe God is testing you. So what do you do? You pray about it. You seek the counsel and wisdom of others. You ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, for comfort. Maybe you continue that down. Maybe you continue pursuing that. Maybe not but you do so in faith. And whether you go down that path or not, if it turns out poorly, you don't assume that you must be in violation of God's will for your life. Perhaps if you made a simple choice, you are, or definitely you are, but if you made a decision in faith and wisdom that turns out poorly, trust God in it. In faith, trust that God must be conforming you to the image of his son. Rejections, failures, disappointments are all used by God as part of his sovereign plan for our good. Now, as we conclude this morning, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians. I don't know the page number, but it's in the New Testament a bit. 1 Corinthians 1. Now, I want to see what Paul has to say about wisdom. So we've seen what the preacher has to say about wisdom, uh, wisdom alone, wisdom without faith. Let's see what Paul has to say about wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Did you catch what verse 21 said? The world did not know God through wisdom. Wisdom is not the means by which we reconcile to God. Wisdom is good, wisdom is necessary, it ought to be pursued, but it is not, it doesn't have a stop on the wisdom train at God's doorstep. Friends, we live in a world that is highly scientific, highly rational. Our world has built such a vast and complicated subway system of wisdom that it no longer takes anything else. Our world has forgotten the mere existence of the faith bus. It doesn't think it needs it anymore. It is decided if you can't get there by wisdom, by common sense, by rational thought, then the destination must not exist. But we know better, don't we? We know that anybody can come to God through faith. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in our goodness, not faith in our intellectual abilities, not even faith in a system, not even faith in a religion, but faith in God alone. We must have faith that God created the universe, that he created people to live in perfect harmony with him. We must have faith that our willful sin and rejection of God created a separation between us and our God, and that has removed the sweet bond of fellowship that we once enjoyed with him. Faith that restoration of that relationship can only come after paying the penalty for our sins, which is death. Faith that the only person of paying that penalty was Jesus Christ, the God-man who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose again three days later. Faith that the same Jesus will return someday to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. The former to spend eternity in heaven, enjoying the presence of God, the latter to spend an eternity in the torment of hell. And friends, this is foolishness to the world. They don't get it, but it is our salvation. If you're unsure of your position before God, if you're unsure if you are on that faith bus, I encourage you to talk to me, talk to one of your friends, talk to one of the other pastors here, and we would love to share more with you about who God is and the call he's made on your life. Please pray, pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the book of Ecclesiastes and what it calls us to do and the life it calls us to live. May we live in faith. Wisdom is good. Wisdom is necessary, Lord. May we act in wisdom as well. But may we be willing to take a step off the edge of the cliff and trust you and you alone with our eternal destiny. Thank you for your word in this time. We pray it will be to our benefit and your glory. We ask this, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.